Hey, what's up guys? This is Guy here with KB Trainings. The lesson you're about to watch is one of the many lessons that I'm creating on kbtrainings.com for the CCNA 200 301. As you know, the CCNA is one of the main certification that you can get in the tech industry. You learn networking, security, cloud, just like we see today, wireless and so on. And you know that before we had many different branches of the CCNA, so all of them have been combined in a single CCNA that I'm creating on kbtrainings.com. The CCNA changed my life, so that's why I'm creating a master course where you learn at your own pace the videos are available online so you get a membership you start learning you'll be able to master everything you need to know take the certification exam and go and start your career over 100 lessons available already so go there and start learning hey what's up guys this is Guy here with kb trainings welcome to the lesson number 5.4.2 in our course on the cisco ccna 200 301 we are still talking about cloud architecture. In the first lesson, we introduced the cloud architecture and we started talking about what is the cloud and what it provides. And in this second lesson, we're going to talk about the different cloud services. I prefer to put this in a different lesson because I want to take as much time as needed to explain all the different cloud services that are available out there. So for this lesson today, we're going to see these few points here. First of all, I'm going to tell you what are cloud services. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about each of the main cloud services, starting with infrastructure as a service or IIS, uh, platforms as a service or PaaS, software as a service or SaaS, and a function as a service or FAS. And then I'm going to finish by giving you some characteristics of uh, cloud computing. This is something that I think is important because I need to mention why companies like to go to the cloud. Because today, a lot of companies, pretty much, I mean, not all of them, but a huge majority of companies have at least uh, one of these cloud services that they use for one of their business somewhere. To get started, what are cloud services? Cloud services are infrastructures, platforms, or software that are hosted by a third party. And when we talk about cloud, we usually see the big three. They're called the big three because they're the one that actually started popularizing cloud services, even though cloud started a while back, but they became very popular in the mid 2000s. Uh, companies like AWS, which I think is the biggest. Right now, they have a big share of the market. Uh, we have Google Cloud or Google Cl Cloud Platform. Um, we have uh, Microsoft Azure. These are the main ones that are playing in the game. There's also IBM Cloud, of course, uh, but these are the big three that started this and they, they, they keep it going right now. So they have services that they provide and users or companies can have access to those services using the internet. That's a good thing about it. Companies don't have to worry about many underlying uh, infrastructure that are running those services because that is provided by the cloud service provider. So we're going to talk about those uh, services. And as I said, the customer has access to the services without any additional software downloads. We have the infrastructure as a service, platforms as a service, software as a service, or function or functions as a service. We're going to talk about them in this lesson here. So I would like to first explain these services and how they fit in a business environment. In the last lesson, we talked about the kind of deployment that is needed for a business to run the actual business in terms of, of uh, tech or IT infrastructure. And we also mentioned the on-premise where before the cloud, or if you don't want to go with cloud solutions, you can have everything on site with you, everything in your building or in your own data center somewhere. But of course, you need to take care of it. So if we talk about the on-premise uh, solutions, you need to start with hardware. You need to have some hardwares in your building or in your business where you do all the computing, the storage and networking. This is the bare metal server that you install in your environment. And as a business, if you decide to do this, you should have a server room somewhere in your building and you need to maintain that server room. You need to make sure the temperature is right. You need to make sure electricity is good. You need to make sure you have all the backups you need. So this is a solution that you need to deploy if you want to take care of it yourself. And of course, with virtualization, you don't have to install a single OS on a single server. You can have a single bare metal server on top of that server, you install what is called a hypervisor, things like VMware or Hyper-V from Microsoft or Citrix or whatever. You can install a hypervisor 
where you're going to install the oper operating system. So virtualization is another level that is very common, like very used these days. It's very rare to see a bare metal server where you install Windows Server, for example. Windows Server is usually on a virtual computer or virtual machine on top of the hardware. So you need to have the hardware, the virtualization, and then you can install your operating system, which might be anything, Windows, Linux, or your own operating system. You install it on a virtual machine that you have. And on top of that, you need a runtime. Every application need a runtime. It's, it's like an environment where the application can run. If you have uh, an application written in Java, for example, you need the GRE. This is not Georgan experience. This is Java runtime environment. This is where your application is going to run. If you have Python, if you have any kind of programming language, you need an environment where that application can run and it plays the middleman between the application itself and the operating or the underlying operating system. And on top of the runtime, then you deploy your application. This is the application that you need for your business. Any kind of application. It might be an email application. Um, as an example here, a stock management application that you developed in-house. You can run it on the runtime. By the way, if you like these lessons on YouTube, don't forget to click on like to help or support the channel. And also subscribe to the channel to see all my videos that I'm releasing. I talk about most of my personal project here or tech project on this channel. So if you don't want to miss anything, make sure you are subscribed and share this video with your community on social media. Talking about social media, do not forget to follow me on Facebook and Instagram. I share most of the behind the scene and also it's a very good way to reach out. Send me a message on Instagram. I'll be glad to respond. Thank you guys and let's go back to the lesson. This is how it should be. This is how the architecture should look like. So from this one here, where do the cloud service provider intervene? First, we have the infrastructure as a service that comes at this level here. IAS or infrastructure as a service, the cloud service provider will give you the infrastructure that you need to deploy your OS and whatever you want to run on it. So they'll give you virtual machines and you are free to do whatever you want with your virtual machines. So they'll take care of all these underlying things. They'll take care of the hardware. They'll take care of the virtualization. You don't care about that. And they do it for you. They give you whatever you request and you just start installing your system and running. This is very good because you don't have to maintain anything. You just request it and you have it. And one of the main advantages is that this is very scalable as you need it. For example, let's say you are a big company like Walmart and it's, it's a big retail store here in the US, of course, and they have a website where they have uh, an e-commerce website, okay? E-commerce website. And let's say we are in any regular season, any regular period, they are prepared to have one or 10,000 visitors on their website at the same time. This works for them. This is fine. Let's say in case they have everything in-house, they have their own servers deployed, these servers will have the capacity to handle 10,000 visitors at the same time. But then let's say that we are maybe at the end of the year or we are in November and it's Black Friday. And during the Black Friday, before COVID, Black Friday was people going in stores and, you know, fight over items and so on. But now Black Friday is online. We have Cyber Monday, all those other events. So Black Friday is online and we have billions, I mean, not billions, millions of people that are trying to visit the website to catch a deal, right? So we don't talk about 10,000 visitors anymore. We're looking at let's say 200,000. These are just examples, right? We're looking at 200,000 visitors at the same time on the website. So if they have their own servers that can only handle 10,000 visitors, the server is going to crush. And this is not an example just out of the blue. This is actually something that happened. I don't know if it was because of this, but I remember on a certain Black Friday, uh, Walmart's website was down for a certain period of time. I'm pretty sure it was overloaded. I don't know why, but it was at least overloaded. But if you are using a cloud service provider, and if it's Black Friday, you know that you are expecting a lot of visitors. Or if you see the visitors all of a sudden start increasing on your web server, you can submit a new order to extend, or you can, according to the contract that you have with them, they can extend your computer capacity. They can extend your CPU capacity or whatever you need for your website to be able to handle whatever is thrown at it. So that's why 
um, infrastructure as a service is a very good thing because you have that flexibility to extend your services or to reduce them as needed and you pay per use. So this is what is called infrastructure as a service. So it takes, um, it takes the virtualization and the hardware part and it gives you the infrastructure that you need to deploy your OS. And then we have platform as a service. With platform as a service or PaaS, this one covers the OS and runtime. You don't need to care about the operating system. They only give you a platform where you can develop and deploy your application. Very good for developers. You don't need to worry about anything. You just have somewhere you can develop and deploy. And yeah, you don't have to uh, worry about patches or updates or anything on these underlying technologies. This is called platform as a service. Then when you have applications that are fully developed for you and ready to use, they might be free, they might be paid. That's called software as a service or SaaS. This is where the application is done, ready for you to use. Um, things like Gmail. I know Gmail is free. Um, Google Drive or whatever. Google Drive, you have, if you have a free version, is like 15 gig, I think. If you have the paid version, like me, I have a paid version with 2 terabyte, and I'm good with the service. It's a very good service, actually, on all the devices. So these are software as a service. Even right now, when you're watching me on YouTube, on kbtrains.com, this is a software that is providing the video for you for free. And it's a software as a service. So any kind of, uh, of software, even your stock management application, you may not have to develop it in-house. You can buy an application that is already developed, ready for you online to use. Applications like Salesforce or many kind of things, there are software as a service. And then we have what is called FAS or functions as a service. This is where companies or cloud service providers provides you with functions that you need to develop your applications. They go even further. They give you models that you can implement in your application development to do whatever you want. And these functions are triggered by events. So whatever event, an event can be anything. It can be a click, it can be a hover or whatever. These events are going to trigger some functions that are pre-built by the cloud service provider to do anything, to maybe launch an, an API call to a certain server or reach out to a database or do whatever. These are functions that are pre-built for you and you can just take, to, take those functions and integrate those functions in, those, in, in your application. You don't need to care about what's happening behind the scene. You don't need to care about anything beyond that, beyond just you developing. And that's why this one is called the serverless infrastructure. Serverless. Doesn't mean that you don't have servers, but you don't know anything about the server. You only deal with functions that are accomplishing certain tasks depending on what you need for your application development. So that's in a nutshell, the different cloud services that we're going to see today. So now I'm just going to go through everything that I have to say about each of these services. Starting with infrastructure as a service, as I said, it offers you compute, storage, and networking resources on demand. This is a big part of it. You demand it, you order, you place your order online, and the service is delivered. And the good thing is that the time of delivery of that order is getting shorter and shorter. If you are requesting an infrastructure, for example, it may take less than an hour, 30 minutes or whatever, and that thing is available for you. The infrastructure is available. The virtual machine is available. You can deploy whatever you want on it. And it's way better than trying to run across town and find servers, racks, and build an HVAC system and all of that for your own. You can just order and it's there, it's available. And usually you pay as you go. So you pay what you use. And uh, it provides with highest level of flexibility and management control over IT resources. This is where you want to manage the servers, the VM. You want to know exactly what you're running on them, which is very familiar to what a lot of people are doing today in-house. And these are different examples of infrastructure as a service. We have DigitalOcean, Linode, Rockspace. These will give you servers or VMs that you can use and run whatever you want on it. Amazon Web Services, Google, and so on. And then we are going to talk about platforms as a service. As I said, this is going beyond the hardware virtualization um, OS. So you get the platform where you can just start developing your application and you can just focus on the deployment and the management of the application not the os not the patches not anything beyond that it's all done for you 
by the cloud service provider. An example of that is AWS Elastic Beanstalk or Google Application Engine or Adobe Commerce and so on. These are examples of platforms where you can develop your applications. And beyond that, we have a software as a service. This is where a whole software is available for you, already developed fully, uh, like Microsoft Office 365. Now they're trying to move everything online. The desktop version is still there, but I think it's fading away a little bit. Uh, we have Gmail, Slack, WebEx, Skype, all those things. There are applications that are available for you. You can use them. They run online. You don't know what's running beyond it, but at least you use them. Some of them are free. Some of them are paid and so on. Um, and then we have functions as a service where the cloud service provider provides you with functionalities that you need for your application development. And those functions are triggered by the event that you have in your app. So they're helping you into building and launching your application. And this is what we call a serverless environment because you don't look at the server. You don't care about what's going on behind the scene. You only uh, get all those functions that are ready for you to use and deploy. Examples of that are IBM Cloud Functions, Microsoft Azure uh, Functions, or uh, AWS Lambda, and so on. These are function as a service that are provided by cloud service providers. And then, as I said, I'm going to finish by talking about some characteristics of cloud computing. First of all, there is the on-demand self-service part, where it's usually automatic. So you go online on the website and you can order your service. Or if you have to talk to a salesperson, you can also do, but the deployment is very easy. It's on demand and you get whatever you need in minutes, in hours. You get it available there for you. You don't have to lift a finger. There's the easy management. So you don't have to worry about anything behind the scene. It's all taken care of by the cloud service provider. That's why a lot of companies like this because it's less work for them. I mean, they have to work on the business part of things. They don't have to work on the technical part or the infrastructure part. There is the scalability and rapid elasticity. I gave you an example of, of Walmart, for example, or companies like Uber or Lyft. If you read into um, the story of Uber, of Uber, at some point when the traffic picked up, they were on a cloud and it went just like this because they had a lot of users coming on the platform. At the same time, they were able to request more computing power. They were able to take all those orders without any problem. If they had their own server, this could have been a problem because they might have planned for 50,000 visits and then all of a sudden they have 500,000. That could have been a disaster, but because they were on the cloud, it was very easy for them. There is the resilience. These services, everything that we saw here is rarely disrupted. It's always available. It may go down sometime when there is like a huge, you know, global internet outage or something, but usually everything is always available. It's somewhere in a data center where you don't even know where it's located, but it's always available for you and you can recover very quickly in case of any uh, disruption. All right, guys, that's all for today. Thank you for watching this lesson. If you have any question, you can go in a forum or send me an email. I'll be glad to respond. And of course, I'm going to leave you a link where you can read some more details on everything I talked about here. And I also encourage you to do your own research. That's always a good thing to do. All right, guys, thank you for watching this lesson. This is available on kbtrans.com. That's where you can see hundreds of lessons that are available. And if you like everything that you saw here, please click on like and leave a comment below so we can start a conversation. And follow me on Facebook and Instagram. Send me a message there as well i'll be glad to respond i'll show you most of the hand the scene there thank you guys for watching and i'll see you in the next video take care and bye